Let's continue our conversation here with regard to what's happening with leadership. Now, we left off on this conversation about moving from the first tier to the second tier to the third tier. It's between that second and third tier, usually where the problems begin, okay? because they really have not paid the price. They haven't gone through the fire of birthing a church, starting a church, starting a new ministry, and suffering with it. And now when it begins to happen, that second or third, that second to the third tier leadership, and in many cases it is the second tier, have failed to really appreciate what it cost to get it established. So it's obvious from Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians that the internal strife and other troubles all stem from a lack of wise and godly leadership. And that was the statement we made the last time in the wake of Paul's and Apollos' departure. The Corinthian believers were tolerating immorality in their midst because now they began to become more Corinthianized, if you will. Look what it says, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you, and immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles that someone has his father's wife. So there's a young man in the church who's a member of the church in Corinth, and he is sleeping with his stepmother. His mother is no longer in, uh, uh, in the scene. We didn't know if there was a divorce. We didn't know if she passed away. There's all kinds of speculations about that. But his father is remarried. So this is his father's wife, and now they're sleeping together, the stepson and the stepmom. And everybody in the church knows exactly what's going on. Now, so that was one of the major problems. In fact, this was a big problem when it comes to the ears of Paul. Not only that, but the believers were suing each other. There were Christians suing Christians in the secular courts as well. And that's prohibited according to Scripture. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. Are you beginning to see that all hell is busting loose in this church? It says this. In 1 Corinthians 6, 1, he says, Does, does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare... Do you dare go to, uh, to, to go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? How could you do that? How can you take and blaspheme the name of Christ in the secular courts? And this is exactly what was taking place in the church. Okay? Not only that. So now the people in the church are flirting with idolatry. Are you kidding me? You see, it doesn't take long. Not only that, but they're disrupting the Lord's table. Not only that, they're abusing their spiritual gifts. This thing is falling apart all over the place. The Corinthian church is not the model church for you today, ladies and gentlemen. Because of your ignorance, you're trying to take your church down the same road. This is a book of correction. Paul is correcting them. It did not take long for them to fall apart. You know, one of the things that I, that I have to tell our leadership in our local church, um, and, I've, and I've made this statement, I know it may sound uh, incredulous to you, uh, for all of you that are here and for all of you are tuning in right now, I, I, I get that. I understand it may sound incredulous, but I've literally said this to all of our pastors um, uh, um, in, our, in, in our church, right? Sitting right, and I've said it to them right in their face, sitting down during the service while the rest of the membership is listening to the same message at the same time in the same place. Okay? And I've said this to them, he said, and I've said this to them, pastors, do not, do not trust the flock. Do not put your faith in the flock. Put your faith in Jesus Christ and his word and his word alone. Because these people will turn on you somewhere along the line. I've said that in front of the entire church body. And here's a classic example, the Apostle Paul. Okay? We now have Apollos okay, as the pastor, and they both have now left the Corinthian church, and it didn't take long for them to fall into sin. It did not take long at all. Look at what they're doing. One guy is sleeping with his, with his father's wife. 
they believers are suing each other. They're now fooling around with idolatry. They're disrupting the Lord's, service, the Lord's uh, supper table, and they're abusing the spiritual gifts. All of this is happening, and this is on the existing leadership. Not that they were without leaders. You had leaders that had no business being leaders. They, they just, they didn't know how to lead. It had fallen apart. Turn your Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14. Therefore, Paul writes, My beloved, flee from idolatry. That would have not happened under his watch if he had been there personally. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17, verse 22. Now listen to me carefully. If this is happening in your church right now and you're the existing leader, let me tell you something. You got a problem. Let me tell you what the problem is. You are the problem. Are you hearing me, pastor? You hear me, church leader? You are the problem. See, this did not happen in the presence of Paul or Apollos. This happened in their absence, which means somebody else was leading and if this is happening in your presence, okay, you have now literally disqualified yourself because you've allowed now immorality and the decadence to come into your presence. You know why? Because there's a lot of pastors who are more afraid of their people than they are of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 to 22. But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you. Because you came, you come together, not for better, but for the worse. These are Paul's words. From the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who approve may become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. For you are eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry, another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you not despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I will not praise you. These was Paul's words direct to the congregation. He was not afraid to say what he had to say. And that's the problem. I'm not talking about that you have to be mean and cruel and ugly and so forth and so forth. But you must say the truth. People will turn on you quickly. Do you think I trust people? No, I trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Then on top of all of that, it doesn't get any better. Someone in their midst, on top of all of their problems that they were facing, somebody in their midst in the congregation began to raise questions about Paul's apostolic authority. It didn't take long for them to begin to discount and reject his authority. It did not take long at all. Trust me, brother, it won't take long with us either. You know, we recently, in our, in our local church, we recently made a decision, which I led in that decision, okay? and that is to split our services up into two language groups. Okay? Um, our first service will now be Spanish-speaking, and, and the second service is English-speaking. I'm leading up the second service in English. We have another pastor be leading up the, 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 the first service in Spanish. Okay? And I, do you think that I cannot see what's coming? Of course I can see what's coming. You know, I was born at night, but it was not last night. It won't take long if the existing leadership does not have control before ugly things begin to happen. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 Look at what he says in verses 1 through 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. Paul writes, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work 
in the Lord. Are you not? I told someone in the congregation, and I said, let me quote to you what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. Okay? Are you not my work in the Lord? And I just, just briefly remind the person of that. I said, you know, by the grace of God, you are saved. I'm nobody special. But I am the person that God used to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to you, and you receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And because I will no longer be with you, because you're going to be under one congregate, under one language group, okay, and I'm going to move on to another. That doesn't mean that I've abandoned you in, uh, at all. But I had to quote that to them. If to others, am I not an apostle? In verse two, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. You are the seal, okay, of the work that God is doing in my life. You're the evidence of it. Verse 3, my defense of those who examine me is this. Do not we have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, even at the rest of the apostles and the, and the brothers of the Lord, Seth, the Lord and Cephas? Why do you think I, you know, in, in the ministry now, I, I, I now my wife now travels with me. Why? It, it's pretty obvious why. Or do only Barnabas and I have a right to refrain from working? Verse 7, who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Or who tends a flock and, and, who tends a flock and does not use the milk of that flock? I am not speaking of these things according to human judgment, am I? Or does not the law also say these things? Of course it does. So now, Paul is being accused of not being an apostle by false people within the church. That powerful first epistle seems to have resolved most of the urgent practical issues in the Corinthian church. But by the time that Paul writes 2 Corinthians, a new and an even more troubling attack on the peace of the church at Corinth had arisen suggesting that a lack of strong leadership continued to be a major problem there. That's exactly what happened in the Corinthian church. Men who had absolutely no training. That's the problem in the church today. So many have no training and have no desire for any training whatsoever. And they are run under the banner of stupidity that says... The Holy Ghost will lead me. Really? Jesus Christ personally chose 12 men. One was replaced, if you recall this. But he personally trained them in the seminary of Jesus Christ for three and a half years before he unleashed them to the world. And then the Apostle Paul was personally trained by the Lord Jesus Christ, if you remember, for three years before he was unleashed to the world. And yet, over 85% of the men who stand in pulpits today have absolutely no training whatsoever. They have their own ideas of leadership. This is exactly what happens here. False teachers a claiming a higher authority than that of the Apostle Paul, had come to town and was systematically undermining the church's loyalty to their founder and Christ's okay, apostle. They raised new questions about Paul's apostolic credentials and began to attack Paul's teaching and his reputation for their own selfish agenda. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we're told this in verse 13. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, distinguishing themselves, I'm sorry, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. Piecing together the clues that we find here in 2 Corinthians, here's what apparently happened next. Paul seems to have heard about the threat of false teachers in Corinth. So he left Ephesus 
where he was then ministering and traveled to Corinth to try to help resolve the issues there. That, this is why Paul leaves Ephesus, which has a profound impact on Ephesus later on. He had promised them in earlier letters, in earlier epistles, that he would visit. You remember that? We find this in 1 Corinthians 4.19, in 1 Corinthians 11.34, in 1 Corinthians 16.5. So he had to seize this opportunity to go now. Let's go back there for a moment. In, in 1 Corinthians 4.19, But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I shall find out not the words of those who are arrogant, but their power. In 1 Corinthians 11.34, if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. So he kept telling him, I'm going to come, I'm going to come. In 1 Corinthians 16, 5. But I will come to you after I go through Macedonia, for I am going through Macedonia. So he kept telling him, he's going to come. But now this issue has become so dire. It is a mess. And now it forces him, he has to leave Ephesus and now come to see if he can help straighten out this problem. But the visit on the circumstances turned out to be a, it became a deeply sorrowful experience for Paul. Paul was not a happy camper. This was not a good visit. A necessary visit, but it turned out not to be a very good visit for him. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. But I determined this for my own sake, that I would not come to you in sorrow again. Apparently, someone in the church, influenced by false teaching, sinned against Paul in a public and humiliating way, probably by defying him or insulting him. Paul seemed to refer to this individual because look at what it says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So Paul arrives, he's with these people, and somebody gets ugly somewhere along the line. And let me tell you something, I've had that happen to me. It is not fun. You die a thousand deaths on the inside. I, I, I still can remember the details of it. It just, it was so dramatic, so graphic, the way the person did it. I've not forgotten it. It has been in, indebitably left an indelible, indelible impression upon me. It's like the way you brand a horse with a hot iron. It is right there in front of me. I never forgot the experience. Second Corinthians five eight. Second Corinthians chapter two verse five through eight. I'm sorry, five through eight is what I meant to say. But if any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree, in order not to say too much to all of you. Sufficient for such a one is this punishment, which, is what, which, was, which was inflicted by the majority. Whoa! So that on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, such one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Wherefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. Now, you remember the individual, okay? Um, you recall the, the young man who was sleeping with his stepmother, okay? And it, it just, it caused such a major stir in the church. It was, I mean, the whole church was harmed by it. Okay? But somewhere on the line, he comes back to Christ, you know, um, he repents, and now Paul encourages him, take him back. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 to 12, we're going to read those. Paul indicated that the episode prompted him to write a strongly worded rebuke in a letter. And this was another non-canonical epistle, another letter that's not written in the Word of God, not, not preserved in the Word of God. And it was sent by way of Titus. Leadership is not always fun. It's just not. You know, one of the biggest problems that we face in, in ministry is that uh, you and I, we deal with problems 90% of the time. It's just rare when somebody brings us good news. 
Most times, it's bad news that people are bringing to us. And now, and this is what Paul is dealing with. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not so much that you would be made sorrowful, but that you might know the love which I have especially for you. He did not enjoy writing these letters to them. It broke him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, look at verses 9 to 12. And I now rejoice not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. That's what I'm rejoicing about. I'm not, I'm not happy that I made you cry or that I made you feel bad, but I am happy that you came to a full state of repentance, for you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. <coughs> Excuse me. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Look what he says. For behold, what earnestness, this, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you. What vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. In everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in that matter. They came to a full state of repentance. He had to lead by example, but he had to read, lead by a letter that he had to strongly rebuke them. Then in verse 12, so although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the offender, nor for the sake of the one offended, but that your earnestness in, on our behalf might be, made, might be made known to you in the sight of God. So you can see, leadership is really difficult. Because, you know, when you talk to a judge... What does he hear? Nothing but bad news. You speak to a police officer nine times out of ten, what is he doing with? Bad news. In the ministry, in the pastorate, what do we deal with most times? Bad news. It, it, it's rare when people share good news with us. It's mostly bad news. And Paul had to deal with issues on a public basis constantly. And so people get a misperception, a misunderstanding of your leadership. But I have to, you have to remind them. They're going to be confronted by the word of God because they have been so contaminated seven days out of week with what? With the darkness of the world. Yes. 